Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted, with Susan Smith. Hello, and welcome to my studio. I am Susan Smith. My studio is Stitched by Susan. I'm standing in front of one of my favorite recent quilts, Kate Facet. I don't know what was your first clue on that. Um, but welcome to a live and unscripted show. These episodes are... Um, live, as the title tells you, and definitely unedited. So they're my way of literally inviting you into my studio to watch while I'm working on a quilt, talking about the processes, the decisions, the choices, even the difficulties that might be involved in various quilts, in the hopes that this will help you in your own quilting journey, just to answer some of the questions, because quilting's kind of a solitary thing, right? You're often on your own when you're working at your long arm. So hopefully this will be of encouragement to you, and some of these tips and techniques will come back to you when you're working on similar projects. Today's quilt is a memory quilt. It is made 100% both top and backing from clothing items. So there's lots of things that we're going to talk about in that process that, that contribute to some of the decisions that I'll be making as we go today. So coffee in hand, we're just about ready. But before we get started, a few credits that I want to give. One is to our son, Will, who does those fun intro voices for us and I'm after him to make me some fresh ones because I feel like we need some new cute um, and funny <laughs> intro voices but thanks to Will for that and a huge thank you is due to my husband Dave we call him Mr. Producer there he is um, he's 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 juggling all the things you know the microphones and the lights and the cameras and all the wires and cables and routers and all the stuff that I could not do on my own so I vastly appreciate that in any given show by the way we usually have four different camera angles sometimes five operating. So it's a bit of a process to make sure they're all feeding and all available and all have decent angles and lighting and all of that stuff. So Mr. Producer does all of that. And last but not least, our good friend Dan Unger, who is the person playing the guitar in the music that you hear throughout these shows. And he very graciously allows us to use that music. It is not available for sale or commercially. Um, so this is where you have to come when you want to hear that lovely guitar music. And Mr. Producer's flagging me. Sorry? Is that for sure? Okay, you guys, I got a plug I'm going to put in here. I just learned this myself. I had this bright idea, but Mr. Producer has followed it through. I'll back up a little bit first. We're hosting a quilting cruise in January of 2025. It's 11 months away. Um, all machine quilting, several teachers, and I'll talk more about the cruises today goes on. But this is the fun thing. I had this bright idea. Wouldn't it be fun if we could make... Mr. Unger's music available to our cruisers. And apparently Dave and Dan have been talking about this and it's going to happen. So one more reason to come on the cruise. You will get to get a copy of this album that we play on this show all the time. It is such great music. Dan is such a gifted musician um, and it, it's relaxing and calming and even inspiring. Literally feeds your soul. It's great music. So that's going to be on the cruise. Yahoo. Okay. We're going to get started on our project, and I've got lots more things to tell you about, so stay tuned for that. But if you enjoy this show at all, please, please do give me the thumbs up button occasionally throughout and hit the subscribe um, box so that you know when new shows are coming. And if you click on the bell, you'll be notified when I am going live, and that can be very helpful. And also, there will be a link at the end of the show, and there's always on my website a link to join my newsletter. I do try to send out a photograph and some description of what project I'll be working on, usually the Wednesday before these shows, a couple days in advance, so you have some idea if the topic is even of interest to you. So feel free to sign up for my newsletter there. Let me take one last sip of coffee and we're going to get at it. Set that to the side, well out of the way. Okay, I'm stitching today on my Bernina Q24. 24 just means there's 24 inches from needle to back a machine. So I do have a large machine on a large frame. And it sure is nice when I'm doing big projects like this just to help with visibility and being able to see the whole thing. And her name is Stella. But for now, we're going to move Stella off way to the left and start loading this quilt. I do want to show you a few things of interest about the backing, which is what I've got spread out here. So this backing is made... I don't honestly know if it's 100% clothing, but it is mostly. And I think perhaps Mickey has filled this in with other fabrics. But there are a lot of things like this one here, which is actually t-shirting. Okay, stretchy type fabrics. Let me find some other interesting ones. This is a woven, but a very um, kind of fine one. And there's actually a dart and it is, it is in the quilt. 
there's overlapping seams like this one here. Can we see those reasonably well, Mr. Producer? I think we can. Uh, we've got some embroidery going on, places like this. I know there's lace somewhere too. Here we go. This is like a, don't they call that a burnout type where there's the design and then there's totally sheer bits around it? So what Mickey has done, because there are so many different fabrics and so many of them are stretchy, is she has actually done what you might do on a t-shirt quilt, which is sew it on foundation fabric. So the whole thing has this muslin on the back. And as you can see, lots and lots and lots and lots of seams. So Mickey's done a great job at squaring up the things, pressing the seams open to reduce that bulk, and keeping the seams pretty darn flat. I'm so impressed, Mickey. So one other thing that I need to watch for as I load this, clearly I don't have just one seam that matters whether it goes horizontally or vertically. I've got seams in every direction. So that's not really a consideration. But I do like to lay out my quilts on the floor or at least measure carefully before I proceed to load to make sure that I've got them oriented correctly. And this quilt is a good example why. It's almost square, but not quite. It's 66 by 69. All too easy if you're not paying attention to load the backing one way and the front the other way. And this is one of those quilts where you'd run out by an inch at the bottom if you got them twisted. So I made very sure to know which way I'm orienting my back and get the top the same way. So in this case, I am doing it um, lengthwise, if you will. The longest length of the quilt will run this way only because I was trying to keep it narrow enough for you to see the whole thing in camera in practice. I often turn my quilts the other way around so that they're widest and shorter if it doesn't matter what quilting design I'm using because then I have fewer passes or advances of the quilt and it's a little more efficient with my time. But for this quilt, it doesn't make much difference. So I'm doing it for best visibility on camera. So there's one of the laces right there. There's all kinds of fun treasures in this quilt. Okay, grabbing my red snappers. I'll probably need two and a half, I'm thinking. Here they are. I'm just going to lay them on the table. So the way that I load, those of you who are regular viewers will know this already. Those of you who are newer, it might interest you. I use the Red Snapper system, which has a little of this same red plasticky product. There's a little rod inside the hem of my leader, and it's just round like my little finger. And then this one snaps onto it, and that's how I load this front edge. The beauty of this method is, you'll notice, I'm not placing my quilt anywhere in particular. I'm just clapping it on the rail. And I don't have centering marks on the quilt or the leader, for that matter. What is important, though, is that I have a straight edge on this edge closest to me that I am loading first. And you'll see in a moment how I proceed with aiming toward a square, square quilt with very little fuss and very little time invested in figuring all that out. I was reading an article the other day all about squaring up a quilt and a backing, and I thought, gosh, you really don't have to do that. Especially the backing. The front, it certainly is nicer if it's square already. And look, I only needed two. Perfect. Okay, so I've got my two on. Am I an okay placement, Dave, or am I too far to this end? Okay, very good. So now what I'm going to do is toss all the remainder of my quilt backing over the back rail of Stella. And then I'll come around to that side and I'll grab two more leaders on the way. Two more snappers, I mean. Let's just move Stella off to one side. And clip her in place so she doesn't keep rolling. There we go. Okay, pulling all this backing over the rail, it is important that you pull it straight over the rail. What part of me is showing on camera, hon, so I know which angle to... Uh, not, much. not much of anything, but my arms do. It's important that this be straight, that you don't have it veering off to one side or the other. Because remember, we don't have center markings. So what's making our backing load straight is the fact that we're going to pull it on straight. So that's important. But from there now, I will just start rolling up. This does have tons and tons of pieces in it. 
So it's probably going to take a little attention every so often. I'm going to reach over my rail, tug things straight and square again. Maybe more tension on that. Okay, someone is asking about the dead bar. Let me roll up a little further and I think I'll be able to show you. That's a great question, by the way. When I first got my Bernina machine, which was back in January of 2023, in the few episodes following that, like maybe in February and even into March, I talked about this a little more because I was kind of figuring out my method. But let me flip this back and show you. What I've done with my leader is it was on this rail and I came down the back of the rail, you can see it here, and under the dead bar and over the top. And I'm going to attach it to this edge here. And then you'll see me flop it back over in a moment. And now the quilt will be feeding under that dead bar. And it took me a bit of figuring to get that right the first time or two. I'm just rolling my quilt and watching the end of it now until it's just, just extending over my leader. And this, not surprisingly, this quilt is not perfectly, perfectly square, and that's okay. I will just let any excess bits extend off the end of the leader, and it will be totally fine. I pulled this just a little too far. I'm going to pull it back a bit. There we go. And I usually keep a magnet on this side of my machine, one of these magnetic bars, and I just clap it there almost like a pin to make sure my quilt doesn't flop off over there while I'm busy clipping at this end. Because that has happened to me before. So now I'm putting on my red snappers again. And I've just let that rolling on process be what makes my quilt backing um, roll on pretty straight. When you have a single piece of fabric without all this seaming, it's easier to see. Um, nevertheless, this is going to do a fine job of rolling it on straight. And it did slip a little bit, so I am going ahead and pulling it back. And I just know to do that because I was watching it when it was rolling on, and I know there is enough fabric there. I just need to pull it into place. And I have one other tip for you. When you're dealing with a project like this that's got multiple seams and is not perfectly square or maybe a, um, a wide backing that's a little stretched off a grain or for whatever reason you seem to have a bit of sag on one side but you're confident that it's loaded straight at both ends, here's a trick for working out some of that fullness. So first off, we're going to let that leader flop back. And you can see now that I'm under that dead bar and it's loaded correctly, right? Here's my leader. My dead bar is right behind it. But if I have some sag, and in fact I do at that far end, you can see that this is sagging down. What we're going to do is disconnect our leader, the tension on it, and we're going to roll it back the other way. And I'm holding the bar that it's coming off of so that there's a little bit of pull, a little bit of tension on it. And this is a bit of a process on this quilt, and it's an important one because this is the only way we're going to be able to keep this backing flat and smooth is fiddle with it a little bit. So I've rolled one direction. Now I'm going to loosen my leaders again and roll in the other direction. Again, keeping a little bit of tension on the one that I'm rolling off of so that there's a bit of pull happening. And what this is doing is distributing any of that unevenness that we had so that I don't get a sag in one area, it distributes it. And hopefully this will be my last one, so I want to make sure that what I'm rolling onto this bottom or front leader um, is smoothly pulled to each side. Again, I'm keeping some tension on those bars so that it's pulling. Sorry if I'm breathing heavy into the mic. I'm trying not to. <laughs> there we go. So that is definitely better. Can you see that? I've got less. Still is a tiny bit loose here, but a quite manageable amount. And it's pretty smooth. I'm pretty happy with that. 
Okay, batting is next. I'm using today Winline brand and it still is an 80% cotton, 20% poly. <coughs> Excuse me. There's my batting. And I've got my batting cut about two inches wider on each side than the quilt itself. So I'm just centering it by eye on this backing. I feel like my batting is sideways. Hang on a sec, we'll soon know here. I tried so hard to get everything oriented right and laying on the floor folded preparatory to loading up. No, nope, it's right. Okay, set the quilt aside a moment. Make sure that batting is smooth, no wrinkles. So I am floating my top, meaning I'm not attaching my quilt at this end of it. I'm only going to attach my quilt at the top end for quilting. So I'm also floating my batting. So it's just hanging down here in front of me and I do keep my floor pretty thoroughly vacuumed and I'm able then to just kick that batting under my long arm and keep it out of the way. And now we're gonna have our first look at the quilt. So this quilt top is 100% clothing. So a little bit of the story behind this quilt. This was a local woman who lived in Spokane and she was a victim of domestic violence actually um, and was killed. And she left behind three sons who I believe are young adults. And so Mickey, who's here watching the show, um, took on the project of piecing a quilt for each of those sons from their mother's clothes. So I've done one already. I did not do it on YouTube, but it had um, weightier things, a lot more denim, some, some pleather and vinyl and things like that on the front, and actually sweatshirts on the back. So that one I approached a little bit differently. I did a more tacking process because there were so many pockets and things, it was difficult to quilt. But this one we're going to try quilting a design. So here's one of the button plackets that I talked about earlier. And there are a few of them, groupings of buttons. So we'll talk about some of the decisions that I made because of that in just a moment. But you can see as I'm easing it on here, the, the fabrics are all kinds of content. This one right here is a linen. This is a super, super fine batiste maybe. So is this one. There's one with lace here. There's one with a bit of embroidery here. Like there's all kinds of fabrics, denim. So it's very um, shifty, right? So I'm going to need to manage that as I work. I'm going to need to be conscious of that with every single pass that I'm squaring up. So this is another one of the advantages of pre-measuring. So I know that I want my finished quilt to be 66 inches wide. So you can't see it on camera, but on my back leader, I've actually got a tape measure permanently attached. And so I can watch what the measurement is on the right and what the measurement is on the left. And I will try and keep that the same every time I advance the quilt, keeping it from, you know, veering off to the left or veering off to the right, that will be helpful. So I'm not necessarily measuring 60 on there, although I certainly could figure that out, but I'm just gonna know it's at 37 on this side and it's at 29 and a half on this side. So I'm gonna watch for that every time I advance it. Okay, quilt is laying on. Let's talk thread for a moment. Um, I'm just gonna move Stella over here for you to see because I forgot to bring an extra spool. I've only got the one that's on here. This is the thread I'm using. It's just a simple, are we seeing it? Nope, need to move closer. Simple cream colored thread. It is 100% poly 40 weight. The brand is Aurifil and the color is 6582. And I'm trying something new today for fun. Um, Aurifil was kind enough to give me a whole bunch of pre-wound bobbins. So they're in a plastic case and they're pre-wound and I have a bunch in this color. And so I thought, what a great opportunity to use those. So these bobbins, however, are um, a lighter weight thread. They are Invisifil, I gotta look at my box. Yes, 80 weight cottonized poly. So that's cool. Now I have a problem, you guys. I was fiddling with my machine and I set down my bobbin casing somewhere. Dave, do you wanna help me out here? He's gonna look for that. The little silver, oh, here it is, here it is. Ha, <sighs> phew, I just about had a heart attack there for a minute. 
Here's my bobbin casing in my bobbin gauge. Remember the back of the shirt, right? Live and unscripted where anything can happen and probably will. Okay. Here's the bobbin. Love it. It is an 80 weight thread, which is finer than what I typically use in the bobbin. So I am going to today run my thread through the bobbin gauge every time because chances are I'll need a slightly tighter tension on my bobbin because I've got a finer thread pulling through uh, the tension area. So I'm using my little gauge. This is just like a Toa gauge. It's just branded Bernina. Drop my bobbin on there around the pulley system. Mm, let's double check it. It's pulling way too tight, but I think I did not get it in there straight in my efforts to make it show on camera. Much better. There we go. So a couple things I'm looking for. I'm looking for a gauge of about 210 or 220. So my dial is showing me that number. I already loosened this up this morning and I did in fact have to loosen it up a little from when I usually have my 40 weight thread in the bobbin. And I'm also looking for it to be feeding smoothly without any jerks. I have learned and I know other quilters have found this too. These pre-wound bobbins, in order to keep them from unwinding during shipment and storage, they're coated with a little bit of glue basically. So you have to kind of unwind that whole first layer um, in order to avoid that gluey coating because it will affect your tension. And if you pull it through this while that is still on the thread, you'll see it. It'll go jerk, 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 jerk and won't flow smoothly. So I pulled that through until my thread is pulling smoothly and the gauge is not bobbling at all. And then I know I'm at the well-wound consistent tension area of the bobbin. Lecture over. I've already oiled my machine for the morning, so Stella is raring to go, and we are all set. One last thing I want to talk about is feet, and I feel like, Dave, we're going to want the close-up camera for this, so I'll pull Stella over the quilt and show this. Let's see how it looks. Give us a sec to swap camera views here. I just feel like if I do it feet away, you're not going to see it well. Is it working? There we go. Okay, where are my hands? No, nope. you've got a static photo, not a video. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and baste while he looks. There's something, something amiss with the camera. There's something amiss with the camera. Let's go ahead and baste. So I've just clapped a ruler foot on there for the moment, but I don't want to stop and wait. I'm going to go ahead and baste. So as I so often do, I'm going to baste up the left side, across the top, and down the right. I am going to put my channel locks in place, which on my machine basically means I'm engaging the belts as though I were computerized sewing. I can still move my quilt, uh, move my machine in any direction. It just provides resistance. The reason I'm doing this is because my usual sort of by guess and by gosh method is not great for keeping a straight edge when the quilt has so much uh, movability as this one does, right? So running up this denim um, is pretty straightforward, but I'm just going to use my channel lock, which I know is stitching in a gauge, and I'll shift my quilt to match where I see it stitching, and then I know that stitching line is straight. If you don't have channel locks, you might want to pre-measure that and pin it first. But when you've got a quilt that's got this much shiftability in it, it's important for establishing any kind of squareness in the quilt. If I was to just stitch across this top edge, which is super stretchy by eye, the chances of it being straight would be slim to none. So I'm going to use this channel lock for that purpose. So channel lock is on. And looks like my bobbin thread broke. Hang on a sec. I heard something a little amiss and I wondered. Let's see what happened. It did break. I'm not fully sure why. So we'll use the Susan method, which is we just rethread it and try. If it happens again, we start looking for deeper issues. but things do happen from time to time. And it is 80 weight thread in the bobbin, so it is quite, quite fine. Yeah, it's not feeding correctly. I can feel it resistance. 
So I wonder if there's thread in the bobbin casing. I'm just checking inside my bobbin casing with the bobbin out visually. Do I see any thread bits? I'm turning it a bit. Nope, don't see anything there. Okay, this is how it goes, you guys. I will show you this one. What has happened is, uh, I don't know if I can do this on the head cam, Dave. What has happened is the little backlash spring in my bobbin casing has popped out, probably just with me messing with the thread like that. I'll see if I can do it on camera. This is the spring that's disengaged itself, right? I just don't know if I can get it in the right place while you guys can see it. In the Bernina bobbin casing, there's little tabs on the side of that spring and there's little uh, slots on the side of the bobbin casing and I've got to get them lined up. And then that spring will pop back in place. And it's really hard to see. No, it's not right yet. When in doubt, double check it. So apparently someone's asking if I'm using pre-wound, do I remove the spring? I do not because I still need that anti-backlash. What that provides is, what that provides is um, when the bobbin is pressed against it, when it's engaged in the machine and the bobbin's been spinning as I stitch this way, there we go, there we go. <laughs> um, the bobbin's been spinning. And when I stop stitching, that spring, the pressure against it, stops the bobbin from keeping on spinning, hence the anti-backlash. So you do need a spring in there or a bobbin genie, which is a brand name, which is a little silicone disc, something that will keep your bobbin from spinning when you stop stitching. And this looks right to me. I don't have my glasses here. I'm wearing contacts and they're not that great, but I'm not convinced that that's right. Okay, let me see. You guys bear with me a sec. I think I have a spare bobbin casing and that might be our answer for today. Mr. Producer is asking, what's that on the back of your shirt again? At the very least, I can compare the two. And by the way, this might just be my opinion, but I like to keep a spare bobbin casing. This is what I mean by casing for just this occasion because it's a re relatively inexpensive spare part and it can get you out of a pinch. So we're going to use the spare. I think I have that spring loaded correctly, but I'm not 100% sure. So we're using the spare. Okay, let's load this puppy back in. I'll try not to lose my train of thought here because he, originally I was talking about the feet that I'm sewing with. Then we got going on basting. Then we got going on fixing. This is how quilting goes some days. It just is. Let's keep basting. We will come back and talk about the feet. Where are we at here? No, it still is not pulling through. Hmm. If I keep having difficulty, I'm going to end up winding a fresh bobbin because that's the only factor I have significantly changed from, say, yesterday when I was quilting, is that I have put these pre-wound bobbins in. When I load the casing and pull the thread, it seems to be feeding beautifully. When I pull up a stitch, it seems to be catching in some way. Yep, it does. Even when I pull it toward the cutter, it's not right. Okay, one more try, and then we're calling it on this experiment. And by the way, it's not the fault of the pre-wound bobbin. It, it's me. It definitely is. But there's something I'm not knowing and not getting right. Now it's pulling, which is good. Okay, someone's asking a question, Mr. Producer? Good thought. Someone's asking if I've checked the tension on the new bobbin case. Thank you for that, because that is important, right? This one is actually running a touch loose. I wonder what thread I had in here before. Perfect.
I'm really having difficulty getting it feeding through smoothly. I'm, I'm not sure what my ideal is today. I am uh, all thumbs today. Okay, it's pulling out of the bobbin smoothly now. We'll put our tension gauge away, all our loose little threads away. And certainly at this point, you could have a little scrap of fabric on the side and be stitching on that to try this out. That would work as well. Um, because I'm in the basting, I'm going to go ahead and try it out here because I, there's nothing to be lost. I probably would try it on a sample if I was in the middle of the quilt. I wouldn't risk messing it up on these fine fabrics. They're so delicate. So I'm just adjusting the placement of my quilt as I go to keep this top edge lined up with my stitching, right? I've got my machine, I know, stitching in a straight line because I've got that horizontal lock on. And so I'm just going to line up the edge of my quilt with where it's stitching. Where I need to, I'm going to pull a little more fabric under the needle a little more quickly. I've kind of smoothed it, my quilt, from left to right. So I know that if there is any little ripples or bubbles, I need to just be easing them in. I don't want to stretch out that outer edge at all. That, by the way, is a feature of a Bernina too. It's got like this coasting feature, um, even when the channel lock is on. If you go at a certain pace, it like kicks into gear and just cruises you right along. And at this corner, I can see that it's um, stretched a little in the corner and also fraying. So I'm actually just going to take that corner off. It's going to get trimmed off. Um, after the quilt is finished and comes off the long arm. And I can just see that visually because of where I'm standing and seeing where that 90 degree angle is and seeing that there's enough room there to trim it off without it looking chopped. This is the linen bit, so I'm pulling up some of that excess. It's wanting to push out in front of me a little and stretch. Getting it under the needle. There we go. Okay. We're basted. We're going to go ahead and anchor with our magnetic bars and then we'll go back to the close-up camera and talk about the feet. So again, I'm floating my quilt top, meaning the front of this quilt is not getting on anywhere. It's literally floating, hanging down here in front of me like so. However, I do want this front I don't want it to be able to pull up as I'm quilting. So I've basted left, top, and right and I'm going to put my magnetic bars on this bottom edge. So these are just simple um, shop or garage type bars, magnet in the back, and I have magnetic rails. So that will hold this front edge of the quilt without shifting while I quilt it. Easy peasy. Okay, close up camera and we'll talk about feet. So what I've got on here right now is a ruler foot. This is the 72S foot. It's got this deep profile, and this is a foot that I use kind of multi-purpose for many things, just because it's easy and it's sturdy and it works well. And what I thought about using for this quilt is this cup clip, which literally just clips onto this foot. It has a matching slit for my thread to feed through. The beauty of the cup foot is wherever I've got bulky seams or pin tucks like you see here, or in fact, maybe the button placket or thick seams, this will skate right over because of that curved shape. So this is kind of my first choice on memory quilts or t-shirt quilts or quilts that have sort of irregularities that you want to skate right over. But it also reduces my visibility because it's about an inch wide, maybe even a little bit more. It's going to be difficult to see, for example, the buttons when I'm coming to them. And it's also wide for even getting between and around the buttons. So this is a bit of a conundrum. What foot am I going to use? And what I've kind of concluded is that I'm probably going to have to change feet during the process of quilting. Because I think I'm going to want this little darning foot, which has a much tinier profile in every way and is very slim for moving in and out among buttons and things when I get close to the buttons. But I think I'm gonna want this for the stretchy fabrics, the bulky seams, all the things. So let's see. I think to start with, I'll put this one on and see how it goes because if it works well, I can use this over the whole quilt. 
if I'm finding that this is not dealing with the irregularities well, then I'm going to stop and switch to this foot and I'll just go back and forth as needed. Good news is, it's easy to switch them, if I can see behind the camera here. There we go. So I've just got a little lever there once I get it in position correctly, which it took me a minute to do. Flip the lever and it's on. And so to switch, I just undo the lever and swap out the feet. So it's not difficult to change them. So no matter what I have to do, not the end of the world. We're ready to start quilting. Now Mickey and I talked about quilting design for this. Remember it is for a guy. So though there are laces and pink things and flowers in it, we thought we could fairly handily reduce that feminine quality by using some quilting stitching um, that is not floral, that is not twirly and swirly. So I'm going to do something that I call the boomerang. Those of you who, those of you who know me for a while know that I love an all over feather design and I have actually a free class for that. There's a link for it in the show description if you want to see that. This is the same basic thread path except it's not feather shaped. It's got corners and points. Mr. Producer is telling me there's some questions. Let's take those a minute and I'll get me a wee sip of coffee before we launch right into stitching. Um, is Stella going to be really in the way? No, she's fine. She's fine. And by the way, I'd love for you guys to chime in. If you really like this type of conversation and talking through all these processes, particularly the setup processes, do let me know because every so often I'll get a comment, something like, wow, I watched the show for 30 minutes before you took the first stitch. And I think that's probably true today. But is this the kind of information that you want to have? You know, when you're going and setting up a quilt that's got some sort of irregularities or things that you've got to consider, or do you just want me to dive right into the stitching? Anyway, I'm, I'm curious to hear your point of view and what things you find the most helpful about the show. And as always, don't forget to thumbs up too. Mandy Southern Stitchin. What are some considerations for quilting t-shirt quilts in regards to thread, needle type, etc. that's a bit different from a traditional quilt top? Great questions, Mandy. Um, I do think that the poly thread is a good choice. It's a strong, robust thread um, intended initially developed for uh, embroidery. So like on caps or on t-shirts or on jackets. So it is a very strong thread and it has a bit of stretchability to it, just a little. Like you don't feel it, but it has that quality. So it's a good, robust thread for stitching on these quilts. Remains to be seen how my 80 weight bobbin is. I think if this quilt had heavier fabrics, I would have kept a 40 weight thread, a stronger, thicker thread in the bobbin as well. This one has quite fine fabrics. Other than that denim, it's mostly much lighter weight, cottony, musliny type fabrics. So I think my 80 weight in the bobbin is going to be fine. I have a universal 9014 needle, which is kind of middle of the road. It's not heavy, heavy like a jeans needle. It's not a fine needle either. So middle of the road, we'll see how it goes. Again, if this was heavier fabrics, like the one I did that had a lot of denim, a lot of sweatshirts, even some vinyl in it. I did use, I believe it was a hundred needle. I'm having a mental break here. Is the hundred the more robust needle? I think so. I would have thrown on a jeans needle. I can't think of the number off the top of my head, but that's stronger needle. So kind of depends on the fabric content. Nancy, what size bobbin does your machine use? It uses an M class bobbin. And Bernina has their own, the red bobbins, but these pre-wound ones seem to work interchangeably just fine. I know lots of Bernina owners that use them. Um, Sandy, is the thread Wonderfill mas Master Quilter? Let me look. No, it's Polyfast. It's Polyfast is the particular one that I have on right now. And Sandy also, and the pre-round bobbins look like Deco Bobs. Correct. They are Deco Bobs, which is a brand of, or a brand, a line of Wonderfill thread, Deco Bob. It was developed to use in the bobbins, although I know quilters who use it on the top as well. So it's just a really lovely 80 weight thread, very fine. When using pre-wound bobbins, do you remove the spring? I did answer that one. I don't remove the spring. You need something in there. So either the spring or the silicone disc or something that will prevent that backlash, even on a pre-wound. Jean, I thought I read that tech spring comes out for pre-wounds, but it doesn't make common sense. It's kind of interesting, you guys. You make me feel like I want to look into this further. It doesn't make common sense. I've always left it in. Mind you, I don't use a lot of pre-wound bobbins, so I guess we'll see how it goes today, won't we? <laughs> so, Joyce, I've used 80 weight in the bobbin with backlash spring in successfully, but I needed to adjust top tension. We'll see when we get started stitching. Joyce, my, my personal preference is to first make that adjustment in the bobbin 
when I'm doing different thread things and then only fine tune it on the top. And especially today, because the bobbin is what I changed. I feel like that bobbin tension is the place to start my adjustments. Cindy, do you also offer any classes on hand stitching? Kind of interesting. I don't at this point, Cindy. I did grow up as a hand quilter, so I do know how to do it. Um, not a thing I do a ton of anymore, and I don't currently have any classes regarding it, no. Is that it for questions? Oh, no, here comes some more. Diane, I think you remove the spring if it's a magnetic pre-wound. Ah, that's a good point, Diane. I don't think I've ever used a magnetic pre-wound, but that makes sense because then your magnet would provide that anti-backlash quality, right? So achieving the same purpose, a little different way. So good thought. Pays to be informed. Robin, only remove the spring when using MagnaGlide pre-wounds. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, apparently there's a number of comments that have to do with this, and this one sums it up. <laughs> Mary Marianne, this is real life, much more realistic than if it all goes swimmingly, as they say here in the UK, and much more like my life. Yep, yep. This is how mine goes too. Pat, I think the setup and watching you work through problems is invaluable. When stitching is going fine, it's going fine. But when it's not, it's not. And it can halt you in your tracks, right? So I appreciate you guys saying that. That was kind of my thought too, is it was a one-off, the person that was frustrated that I just didn't dive into the quilting. Because these shows are about a lot more than just the quilting, right? They're about the whole surrounding thing, how to get it square, how to get it flat, how to deal with multi-seams, whatever the case may be. And I'll reiterate too, um, the projects that I do are almost always client quilts or my own quilts, but like real life projects. They're not pieces of fabric that I loaded just for today. So I'm not really teaching the quilting. I'm teaching how to work on quilts. So visibility might vary depending on fabrics and styles. This is just what I have in my studio. Valerie, seeing you load and quilt and work through problems on a quilt that you often even complete in the same recording is so reassuring and empowering to me as I get more comfortable with my long arm. Great. I appreciate you all saying that really truly because that's my aim. So that lets me know we're, we're reaching it. Okay, last sip of lukewarm coffee. We're on our way. Let me move the cup clip, but we'll keep it handy in case we need it. Okay, I'm starting at the upper right hand corner. Doesn't matter if you start left or right. Honestly, I just always seem to do this because I'm basting on this side and then I just start quilting here and it's what I'm so used to now. Okay, my stitch length is set at 10. I'm going to use BSR1, which on the Bernina means that it's stitch regulated. Plus there's kind of a coasting stitch even when I'm not moving. Um, I think that's all I have to tell you. I need to put side clamps on though. I feel like my trusty E edge clamps are not going to work here. They're not. Can you, can you see it? Um, no, because I'm attached. I'm just going to tell you my little E edge clamps have such a tiny, tiny, tiny narrow channel that the quilt backing needs to fit into. And because this is two layers, it's got the foundation fabric and there's a lot of seams. It's just not going to work well. So I'm going to be satisfied with just putting my two clamps on each side of the quilt. I love the long, long clamps that provide the even tension all the way along, but there's sometimes when they just are not the right tool for the job. So this is what I'm doing today. And I have my trusty vintage yardsticks that I'm going to pull out and insert under the elastics just to hold those clamps up a bit so that when I move my long arm to the edge, I don't bump into them. And I'm gonna do that at both ends. So I'm at the other end now, putting on my clamps. Oops, dropped one. And by the way, the tension on these is just a little bit. I don't wanna pull so hard that you can see the clamp pulling a scallop into my quilt. I just want enough tension so it can't pull inwards as I'm quilting. My straps are elastic, so I can adjust them in that way. I just, at shows, I so often have people come in and talk to me and their elastics are worn out. Like literally the elastic is shot and it, that really is a product of just pulling them way, 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 way too tight too often. So here we go. Boomerang. Oh, hang on a second. I've still got my channel locks on and I have to trot around my machine, get 25 steps in to undo them. There we go.
Now we're starting, I promise. You can see why it's called Boomerang. So when I first developed this design, I did it on a quilt or two, and then I showed pictures on Instagram, and I invited people to chime in with their ideas for a name for the design, and I got all kinds of fun things. But Boomerang is what I settled on because it's kind of this out, across, in, out, across, in, and I just thought it was so descriptive. And you can see there, I was just bumping up a little bit against my clamp, so I'm going to pull my ruler in closer. It's just hoisting that up a little more. Can you see how that lifts? That's what I'm after, so I don't bump into it. There we go. Clearance. I am probably going to leave my channel lock on for the whole day today. When I'm working on a quilt that's got these oddities, like buttons, like tucks, like... See how this ribbon is kind of in here? In those areas, I'm going to need to slow down. So I've got to be able, at a second's notice, to change my speed. Now, I don't know if at your long arm you've ever stitched with a cup clip or a spoon foot, um, anything that's got that curved bottom, but I am going to stop and change here because I know the feel of that and how much easier it is to go over these irregular areas with that foot on. So I'm going to take the opportunity right here while I'm at the edge of the quilt to just stop and break thread as we quilters call it. I reinforced my stitches there. I'm going to cut my thread. I'm going to change feet and I'll just do this whenever I need to. Even if it's in the middle of the quilt, I honestly can do it. But this time I'm right near the edge. So it's super easy to do, but quilting will be easier and I'll be able to go at a faster speed if I have my cup clip on. So I'll just keep that other little foot handy. I'll stick it to my magnet, ha, huh, at the front of the machine. Then I know where it's at. Um, my cup clip is not quite lined up with the slot of my other foot. Hang on a sec. Oh, I see. My thread is a little frayed. Let's rethread. I caught that some in the slit of the foot and broke a fiber or two and it started fraying. There we go. Whoops. <laughs> I told you I'm all thumbs today. It's hysterical. Where it sort of gets. There we go. My thread is still not feeding into the middle. There's my trusty cup clip. Beautiful. A few anchoring stitches again. And no matter whether I do that in the basting or whether I do it in the middle of the quilt, I always do those anchoring stitches. Mr. Producer's asking me a question. Do okay. Apparently the sound is coming through scratchy. You guys keep us posted too. He's listening in the headphones. If it continues, we'll maybe try a different mic or fresh batteries. Let's see how it goes. Let's get some quilting done, folks. 30 minutes passed already and nothing's done yet. So those of you who have stitched my feathers, be watching and you'll see how this is the same thread path as my all-over feather design. It's just got three corners instead of a rounded edge. And we've got skip stitches. Let's have a look at this. Can you guys see this here, the skip stitches? I saw that happen, so I'm going to back up to it. And in fact, I'm going to back up to the nearest point, and that's where I'm going to anchor my new line of stitching. And again, I'll use what I what is kind of my method, and that is anything can happen once. So I'm just going to restart and restitch and see how it goes on. And if it happens again, then we've got to look more deeply. We might have to look at not using an 80 weight bobbin thread. Um, I hate to change in the middle of a quilt, and yet I also know that the person who this quilt is intended for is not a quilter, nor indeed even a sewer of any description. So the chances are, if I have the same color, they will never, never see it. 
but we are going to pause you guys and try and adjust the mic. We may put on a new mic just to try and improve that sound for you. Bear with us a moment. Listen to the music. stitching by oh a couple or three stitches I would say pull up my bobbin thread and hang on to it and I'm going to do some short very close anchoring stitches right in that corner my thread tails out of the way and then proceed with my with my quilting and let's see how we get on pause a second and cut those thread tails Perfect. Nope, skipping again. Okay. So we're going to say twice tells us it is so. That bobbin thread is just too fine. It's not achieving our purpose here. And chances are it's because there are, there's so much thickness on the back, right? We've got not only the double layer of fabrics, including the foundation fabric, but there are seam allowances in that too, right? So there's a fair bit of thickness on the back and the 80 weight is just not uh, sturdy enough to put up with that. So we're gonna back up to a corner again and bear with me a sec while I run out of camera. I'm gonna grab a matching uh, thread and get a bobbin loading so that we're all set once I get that undoing in place. If we're able to have this overhead camera for a sec, they can see my bobbin loader if they want to. Berninas have a very lovely onboard bobbin winder right here. And it is a separate motor from the stitching motor. So I can set this to be winding um, while I'm doing my undoing, right? And it'll be all ready for me when I get ready to stitch again. I was just this week, by the way, working on a little video on how I wind bobbins and some of the variables that you can change, like how full your bobbin gets. So be watching for that on YouTube within the next couple of weeks as we get it edited and finished and published. Um, maybe it's a good moment to mention, I've been working on a series called Know Your Machine with this idea in mind. There's all kinds of features and little things about your machine that you may or may not know that may be of help to you. And one of them is when loading a bobbin, you know, how to control how full that bobbin gets. Because if it's over full, you're gonna have tension issues with every new bobbin. So specifically I'm talking about Bernina Q series because that's what I'm showing everything on, but a lot of the tips will have to do with more machines than one. So check out that series. It's called Know Your Machine and I made a little playlist on my YouTube channel so it's pretty easy to find them all. I think there's only two or three so far. But over time I will keep adding to that grouping. Okay, so the pre-wounds we're going to keep for backings that are less complex. Note to self. Just waiting for the bobbin to finish. Just takes a few moments. And typically, actually I'll grab another one because typically I have one winding. So when I change out a bobbin, I get the next one winding so it's ready for me when I'm ready to change. So I will do that this time too. When this one's full, 
I'll set up the next one winding. And then we're always ready. In season and out. That's us. Gosh, it's like watching a watched pot, isn't it? It never boils. <laughs> And you can also adjust the speed of how fast this bobbin winds. And I have mine on the slower side. I found that the faster I made it, the less reliable the good tension was on it. I was having troubles with sort of unevenness of tension in my bobbins. So that was a suggestion from the Bernina service guy. It was just slow it down a little bit. I know that is certainly true of quilting. You know, again, at shows, I see all kinds of people. Um, running the quilting machines and trying them out but you get people that are we call them the zoomers and they just run that thing at top speed and typically don't get good stitch quality and it's just when you're at the upper edge of what it's possible for it to do just because you can doesn't always mean you should so I feel kind of like that with the bobbin winding too I can make it wind faster but I don't get as good a result again lecture over <laughs> Diane is reminding me to use my gauge. Bless your heart, Diane. You're the best player on my team. This too, I should just leave sitting at the front of the long arm while I'm working today so that it's a constant reminder to me because yes, I have changed the bobbin thread weight now. Now my tension is pulling, um, it tells me tighter. It's running at a higher resistance. So I need to loosen that up a touch. And it's funny. When I'm working by myself, you know, with music in my ears or an audible book or whatever, I'm pretty good about remembering this stuff. But boy, when I get on air and I'm talking a mile a minute, as I do, it's all too easy to forget. So thank you for reminding me, Diane. I appreciate it. Beautiful. I am just going to leave that puppy sit right there at the front. Okay, bobbin in. Snap it into place, close the bobbin door, pick up some of the tools, <laughs> all the things. Okay, here's where we stopped. Find out where I was. I forgot to drop my blue seam ripper there, which is what I typically do. So I don't get lost in a busy printed quilt. I'm just gonna take a couple more lock stitches to make sure it's over that earlier stitching. Here we go. Let's see if this solved the problem, folks. Going to trim the threads. Okay, bear with us again, folks. Am I muted? No. Oh, okay. Um, Dave's just over my shoulder here adjusting the camera. It's focusing incorrectly. I'm not sure what it's doing, but apparently it's not quite right. So he's fixing that for you. We're trying to. Trying to. <laughs> Which is not this? No, it's that. Oh. <laughs> so it's focusing on this little geezer here because it's kind of in the line of view. This is always a conundrum, how to get the best possible view for you. We keep learning. Uh, no. It's not doing it? No. Do I need to cover that up? Sorry, guys. Well, I'm going to keep stitching while you look for black tape, okay? Go ahead. We're going to try and find some black electrical tape to, to clap over that and see if that will help. Let's get going. Oh, you guys, this is one of those days. I heard it ping, so yes, it did turn off. Bless its little heart. <laughs> this is one of those days. You guys get a good view of Mr. Producer fixing things. Are we good to go? This is definitely one of those days. We all have them in the quilting room. You guys don't always have them with cameras, but it's always something, isn't it? Okay, we ready to stitch? I think so. <laughs> what are we at now? 45 minutes? <laughs> Here we go.
You'll be able to get a good view of it in the denim, I hope. This quilt as a whole, I didn't really give you a great view of it at the beginning. It's um, not really log cabin, but it's like quarter log cabin blocks. So Mickey clearly pieced it kind of in quarters and then put those quadrants together. A very, very good use, I think, of um, the memory quilt idea. You know, when you are making a memory quilt, often one of the challenges is having these wildly different fabrics. It's one thing if you've got, for example, all shirtings. They're all, you know, largely similar. But when you've got this enormous spread of weights and stretchability and all these things that are in this particular one, then doing strips like this and assembling it kind of like a log cabin giant block is a really great idea. For those of you that express that you're thinking about doing memory quilts, um, a great place to find ideas is on Pinterest. There are some super creative people out there who have done some really beautiful things with memory quilts. So there's some great ideas out there. One that I have used, I've done it at least twice, is um, Victoria Findlay Wolf has a pattern called Cascade like a braided quilt you know how those overlapping angled pieces like a braid except hers is curved so you do have to cut each piece individually but you are able to cut them with a rotary cutter they're a gentle curve and it's just a, very, a slightly different look so that's one that I have done and enjoyed the result of The stitching is doing pretty good. I do see one spot here where it skipped a couple or three, and I'm just gonna drop a pin there actually, and I'm gonna come back and just replace that one stretch a little later on. It needs to be replaced in order to be stabilized and be secure. But I didn't see it till I was well beyond it. And mostly, this is behaving quite nicely now. So I think that was the ticket to have a bit stronger bobbin thread. And some of those things, I just don't know, and you wouldn't know until you try it. So try. I use the Deco Bob thread. I usually wind my own bobbins, but I use the Deco Bob thread for a lot of my quilting, and I really, really like it. But it just proved to be not quite the right tool for this job. Got some skipping again and I think I am going to go back for that one. So here I'm trying to think in the back of my mind if I have any more ideas in my arsenal of tricks. This is a uh, knit fabric and it's very, let me pull forward so you can see, it's very uh, smooth and tight and I wonder if it's not just that difference of weave or fiber that's causing the skips here. So for starters, my answer is gonna be, I'm gonna slow way down over this fabric. Sometimes just slowing it down will, will answer the problem. But you can see right here, I got quite a few skip stitches and I, and I can't leave that. And we'll just play this project by ear, honestly. You know, I knew it was going to be a bit fiddly and that's okay. Uh, memory quilts often are, but we'll play it by ear in terms of how long we stay on air. I'll try and finish this one pass at least, and then we'll talk about it and see if you guys have questions and see if we want to keep going further. You know, I'm willing to stay on and just keep on quilting. Um, nothing brand new is going to develop anymore, but I feel like it might be helpful to you to see the first advance that I do and how I go about um, checking the squareness of things.
we are going to by the way you guys mute the camera and switch or not the camera mute the microphone and switch it out for another mic because we're still having trouble with it so i'll be quiet for a few minutes but i'll just keep on working as best i can while we do that Okay, we're back on. Let's see if that helps. We've got a new headset on. See if that's the ticket. Now, let's see, I gotta figure out which direction I was going here. Success or no? Hmm, apparently still the sound is not great. You know what, guys? I may just not do a lot of talking today and just get out the quilting. really slowed down my pace probably 30 percent i'm getting pretty good results with this stitching until i broke it as i said that um pretty good results with the stitching and it certainly is worth it for that if it keeps on breaking you know i'm just not really sure apparently there are lots of comments and suggestions coming in so let me get things rethreaded get that bobbin thread trimmed get back to my splice area and we'll sit and chat for a minute because maybe some of you have done this more times than I have and have some experience in this and gosh I'm always willing to hear new ideas let me grab my seam ripper I'm just going to go ahead back out to that basting edge because I'm that close to it and can today and then I'll stop for a sip of coffee a little restorative and love to hear your thoughts One of the things that's so great about the quilting community is that generosity of sharing of ideas. And while I undo, I'm going to talk about one more generous thing. I mentioned ever so briefly earlier that Dave and I are hosting a machine quilting cruise in January of 2025. Sorry, Dave? I can't have the picture when you're in the shot, so if you want to talk about it. Okay. Um, let, let's, uh, let me hold that for just a thought, for just a moment, and we'll have a look at the comments here. Let me close Stella up. Let me grab my coffee cup, get organized. We'll talk for a minute and I will come back to the cruise in just a jiffy. Okay, here we go. <laughs> it's been a morning, hasn't it? Or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. We'll start with the easy ones and then we'll get to the ones that apply. Okay. Gail's asking how I hold down my red solo cup. Super easy, Gail. I put a little magnetic bar that I stuck to my machine, and I have two red solo cups with a magnet in between them. So I can just lift out the top one, empty the threads, plop it back in. Easy peasy. I'm sure there's more permanent ways I could do it, but. This is the backing of the batting. Gene, do, do you just clamp the, the batting or all layers? I, the backing. I usually just clamp the backing because my layers are already basted together. When I put my clamps on just the backing, it's in fact holding all the layers because I do baste before I side clamp. 
and that's why I do it. Mm -hmm. Susan, can you explain the yardsticks with the clamps, please? Absolutely. All they're for, Susan, is they're going under the straps of my clamps and they're just lifting the clamps up a little bit because I don't have a ton of excess beyond my quilt and because those clamps are kind of bulky when I move my long arm close to them it bumps them bang bang and and it makes me stitch oddly so if I lift the clamps up a little bit the long arm just sails right under them that's all it is yardstick curtain rod anything long and straight will do that trick Annette hello from Denmark which of the patterns are easiest the one you stitch now or the all over feather I would say the all over feather, just because you, um, more people know how to make a feather and it's rounded and easier to see. And you really, I think, want to get that movement established before you start putting corners in it or else you get to a corner and you think, where in the world do I turn next? I do in my monthly membership, if you're interested in it, I do teach this one in depth with some drawings and some doodle sheets and ways to, ways to go through it. So today's just a, a bird's eye view of the thing. This was in response to saying, saying I got something about me. I can't remember what it was. Carol's asking, does he ever quilt? Meaning Mr. Producer, I'm sure. He has once or twice, Carol, just so he can say he did. <laughs> and he did piece a block for the friendship quilt that a bunch of my students made. There is a Mr. Producer block in that quilt. Sandy, when I wind my bobbin, my thread goes through three loopy deals and not two. I have a Bernina also. I agree on not filling bobbins totally full also. By loopy deals, do you mean on the top thread holder, Sandy? Every person I've worked with at Bernina and my instruction manual tell me to, so I've done to, and I've been successful with it. So, but you know, if it isn't broke, I wouldn't fix it. <laughs> this is a two-part. Okay, two parts coming up. Diane, Dave, the camera position was good enough. We could see the stitches on the quilt. Okay, second part. Dave, but you don't have to answer Susan after the show asking why it was out of focus. <laughs> True. Jerry, for the skip stitches, try lowering your foot a bit. That is a great point, Jerry. I will give that a try. Yep. And Jean, perhaps isocord instead of orophil. So, so wonderful is what I have on. Quite different from Orophil. Wonderfill is very similar to Isocord in that they're both 100% trilobal polys and in my experience have behaved the same in my machine. I, I use them both regularly without any trouble. So it's not Orophil, just to make it clear. Lisa, are you using sharp or ballpoint needle? Which is your go-to? And Kimberly is kind of asking too, maybe a larger needle size and or ballpoint tip would help with the skipping. Good point. I will switch out to a larger needle. I don't actually think I have any ballpoint in my arsenal. Good thing. I should have some. I, I absolutely should. And I might end up doing that this afternoon. Like if I keep having trouble with this, that might be a thing that I just need to do. Victoria, I had this problem when I tried Orophil. It was skipping when sewing backwards. I fixed it by using the usual Glide. So this is more like Glide as well. Glide is also 100% poly thread and just the smooth quality of it, they behave similarly. Northern Sioux, not sure what needle you're using, but would either a ballpoint or coated be more adaptable to the various fabrics you're encountering? You know, this is interesting. We're obviously getting a theme here of try a different needle. And I talk about fairly often choosing the right needle to go with the right thread, but in my mind, I'm usually thinking eye of the needle size or maybe size and robustness of the needle. So much of my quilting, I just use the standard universal needles for that. I don't even have a very big selection of needles. So that might be something literally that I need to go out and remedy today and get some different needles. Are there more before I go and change my needle? Nope, that's, that's it. Okay. So let's... Let's try this on for starters, is we'll put on a heavier needle. Hang on a second while I find one jeans needle. I do have those. I need a screwdriver too. One second. I did tool caddy is so handy. Okay, we have another comment. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm misunderstanding. Okay, while I'm standing in front of this camera and while I'm changing the needle, I was talking briefly about um, the crews and the generosity of quilters. So one thing that we have, you know, as Mr. Producer and I have been dreaming about this cruise for the last couple years, we've thought to ourselves, we really, really, really want to make this cruise about something a little bit bigger, just a little bit bigger than, you know, just piecing another quilt, which is all very lovely. We all want to get together to quilt. Um, but it's important to us too that we kind of have reasons for what we do. So 
With all that in mind, we have invited a sponsor along on the cruise. Um, It's a lady that I have never met in real life, but we've met virtually. Um, She was a guest on my podcast and so forth. And her name is Courtney Kimball. And she has this organization that she calls One Common Thread. And we're going to put, I think Mr. Producer is going to put up a photograph of her. And I did release a little YouTube episode this week that Courtney introduces her organization and what it does. And um, she just helps some very disadvantaged women in a third world country by providing them with jobs. And they have to do with quilts. So it's very cool. It's a good fit. So there's Courtney sitting in the middle of some of her friends in Honduras. Um, It just feels like a really good fit. We've had some great conversations. So Courtney is going to come along on the cruise. And I think her husband is coming too. And she's going to have information about these specific women that she helps what a difference it's made in their lives. Um, Generally, what these ladies do is create hexes, like prep hexes, for either finished quilts or more often kits. And then people can buy those kits, those ready to go, you know, for paper piecing type hexes. So this has just been creating a job market for these women who are still raising families, who are sometimes the sole supporter of their families. It's all a very, very cool story. So listen to Courtney tell it. Um, You can see that on my YouTube channel. It just went up this week. It's just a short... I don't know, maybe an eight minute video, me a little bit, her a little bit talking about it. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, the cruise would be a great place to meet Courtney and sort of get immersed in what she is doing. But if you, you know, also just look her up on, on um, social media or her website to see what they're all about. Okay. Needles on. Jeans needle people. We have not gotten much quilting done so far. This is hysterical. And I was going to lower the foot a little bit. Let's do that. It is kind of amazing to me how many different things there are that add up to a beautiful quilting stitch. And in some ways, it could be discouraging because you're like, how can I ever think of everything? But in another way, it's helpful because it's not usually just one giant thing or or your machine that's just not cooperating or thread. It's usually a combination of things. And we have not found the combination yet because there's another skip. But it is almost always (laughs) happening on this tricot fabric. So I do wonder if the ballpoint needle is going to be the ticket. I am desperately going to try to get to the edge of this pass and to show you guys one advance. That's kind of my my only goal right now. So I'm going to keep proceeding until I get to that point. Um, But I think that's what it's going to come down to is I've got to tootle off to a quilting shop and get me some ballpoint needles. But back to it all adds up. Um, it's just true in a number of ways. You know, the, the stitch quality adds up from, you know, the loading of the bobbin to the tension on the bobbin to the needle size to the needle type. And then square quilts. That's an, an add addition process too. It's cumulative from, you know, the cutting of the quilt to the piecing to the pressing. And then when it gets to, we long, to us long armors is a better way of putting it. Um, It's a matter of how we load it and how we advance it and all kinds of things come into play and it all adds up to a square and beautiful result and I'm just getting so many skip stitches. Okay, you guys, we're going to have to make a judgment call here and I think it's going to be, Mr. Producer Sir, that we're going to have to stop for today and I've simply got to get another needle. Now the question is, you guys that are watching, do we want to put me on camera again? I'm, I'm just thinking literally talking, <laughs> just literally spitballing here. Like I'm wondering if either later today or even tomorrow morning, I might be able to come on air again so that you can see more of this quilt because I haven't gotten to an advance. I haven't gotten to any of the buttons or things that I even talked about, but this is just happening too, too frequently to think that these little tweaks are, are the answer. So ballpoint needle is going to be my next thing of choice. So I think with that, we're going to go for the moment, watch on the YouTube channel. And again, subscribe, 
hit the thumbs up button and particularly click the bell so that you can get notified when I go live again because I don't even know what time it would be if I could come on this afternoon it might be at three o'clock pacific time or maybe I'll aim for nine o'clock in the morning again tomorrow because you guys are used to that time 9 a.m pacific um, and just come on and quilt for another hour so that you can see part of the process and by then I'll have had a chance to get that needle get it loaded and see if I can get things stitching more smoothly meantime Live and Unscripted, which is what we've called this show, this is this is what it's all about. Letting you kind of see into some of these things that happen. I just don't want to make it uh, pain, painful for you to watch me go through every step of the process, but I'm willing to share when I figure out what the difference is. Like, what can I do differently to fix this problem? I'm happily willing to share that. And someone was just commenting, you know, thanks for taking us on the journey. Um, that that's kind of the goal of this is for me to just show you in real time and in real life this sort of stuff happens in a quilting studio and as discouraging as it might be like we're problem solvers and when you're working with a quilt like this one that has so many different things from your typical you know 100% cotton quilt you're going to face other difficulties and so we're going to problem solve so i appreciate those of you who have chimed in with ideas because that's how we all learn I usually joke that I collect quilting tips like most women collect shoes and it's kind of like that like I love hearing from you I've found this and this and this that works and try this and look at that and all those things add up so I appreciate you tuning in I appreciate you sharing the things that you know and I'll continue to share the things that I know and I'm learning as we go Kimberly I'd love to see if you're able to resolve the issue and see more of the quilt and quilting later I think tentatively I'm going to say we'll try tomorrow morning at the same time um, but you'll see it on my YouTube channel. So come back in a couple hours to my channel and you'll see it scheduled. And then you'll have a good idea of when it's going to be. Click that bell so that you get a notification when in fact I do go live. Okay, anything else we want to say, Mr. Producer? Um, I have one question if you want to ask. There's a question apparently. Let's have a look at that. Cindy, can you show how you lowered the foot? I also have a Bernina Q series and would love to know. Absolutely. Can we put the close-up camera on again? Yeah. I'm just going to pop the cup clip off because you'll be able to see better. Okay, any foot that's got this brass wheel has the ability. Okay, let's do this. There we go. Any foot that has this brass wheel has the ability to be raised or lowered. It's much like the leveling wheel on the bottom of furniture, right? And so your goal is that when your hopper foot is bouncing on, on the low end, it's just brushing your quilt surface. And clearly the thickness of quilts changes from a thin cotton baby quilt to you know a denim or a t-shirt quilt that's when you want to adjust the height of your hopper foot so that was a really great tip from the person who mentioned it because that does affect your stitch formation if your hopper foot is way too high for the quilt you're working on it will tend to produce skipped stitches so great point you know another one that I thought of um, we can have a bigger picture again please hon another one that I thought of but I don't think it's an issue in my case is when you've got some dead bar or leveler bar at the back if that's too high and your quilt is wobbling with each stitch if you're seeing a lot of that vibration that can affect and cause skip stitches too but I've already adjusted that and fine-tuned that on my machine so I do not think that is the issue um, but it's something that you might consider and put in your collection of tips to take forward Venetia, maybe use a universal needle. The eye is a bit longer, but the tip is between a sharp and ballpoint, so it can be used on both cotton and knit fabrics. I think what I have is a universal needle, Venetia, but I will go have a look at the packaging, and I might even try a different brand. Like I've got a Schmetz on right now, and I know there's Bernina Pro needles. You know, all those little things, they might only be a tiny bit different, but that tiny bit might be just what I'm needing today. Cindy, thank you so much. My foot is very high, and I've wondered why fantastic and it's another youtube episode that's coming out is my favorite feat and it mentioned it has all the ones that i was showing today because they are my favorite standard feet for most quilts and i talk about that process it's it's important and it's just a little thing that if you know that about your machine and can adjust it that can make a difference i think in some other long arm brands you can sometimes change actually the needle bar too which will affect where that hopper foot is resting so in some way in your brand, it might be worth looking into how you can change that hopper foot height because that can make a real difference. Multiply so, this by about 150. Whole bunch of oh, Cena, you're a great instructor. I appreciate the authenticity of your videos. And Mr. Producer is saying multiply that by 150. There's a lot of people saying it. I appreciate that from you guys because 
you know, sometimes I do wonder, does anybody really want to see me struggling <laughs> in my quilting studio? But this is really, truly what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. And there are lots of quilts that go smoothly without any ripples and away you go through them. But when you get a difficulty, what are you going to do about that? And it does happen. It happens to all of us. Um, I've quilted, I was just totting up in my book the other day. I'm almost at 1300 quilts. I thought I was over, but no, I'm almost at 1300 quilts. And still, right? I run into things I've not encountered before. Problems I have difficulty solving. So this is probably going to be a lifelong learning experience and I'm okay with that. So a quick sum up before we go of things that I've mentioned. I know I've been a little scattered today, but one that I want you to take note of is the cruise that we're hosting that's happening in January of 2025. I've talked about One Common Thread, who is going to be one of our sponsors and is along on the cruise. Mr. Producer is putting the website on the screen there if you want more details. Beth Ann Nemesh is joining me. Sam Alberts is joining me. They're both wonderful quilters. So we're going to have this broad range of quilting styles and instructions um, business related topics, all kinds of things on that cruise. Um, what are some of the other things? I do still have a podcast, Measure Twice, Cut Once. And at this point, I've just been uh, re recording, not re recording, but re releasing the episodes on YouTube so that you can find them on that platform as well. But there are some new episodes coming your way in the near future. So look forward to that. And what else, hon? We'll be back yeah, another thanks is due to Mr. Producer, who is in the background problem solving. You've seen some of it today, you know, switching out the cameras, dealing with the, the funky focus of the camera. So I really, really, really do appreciate all of that. It's It's been a good time. So thanks you all for joining me and we'll do our best to get back on tomorrow morning and you can see a little more of this quilt as it goes. I'll name it the same thing so that people watching later can find the two episodes. So thanks for joining me. Have a great rest of the day and I'll go and try and do a little more problem solving.